When time and space are through, I'll be found in you. God, you know we don't believe that. We kind of do a little bit. Help us to believe it more. Help us to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, hopefully, as you know, hey, Pam, you're back. No, you're not Pam. I'm sorry. I put, I put my glasses on. I got to remember not to talk to people while I'm preaching because it throws me out. Hey, anyway, I am glad you're here. And uh, if you haven't been here for the, last, uh, for the last several weeks, we've been preaching through John 6 and 7. So this is kind of like a culmination of the things uh, that we've been preaching, okay? And we've been talking about goodwill, bad will, free will, God's will. It's uh, complicated stuff. And this morning I want to share some stuff that's really helped me. If it doesn't help you, well, just be grateful for the great music that you heard this morning, okay? Anyway, this morning we are in John uh, chapter 7 where Jesus uh, tells us about the river of life. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well, splish, splash within my soul. Spring up, oh well, splish, splash, and make me whole. Spring up, oh well, splash. But, and give to me, give to me, give to me, give to me that life abundantly. River of life. I know that I'm supposed to have a river of life flowing out of me, but if I'm honest, it seems like most of the time I've got a river of something else flowing out of me. When Jesus talks about rivers coming out of us, I think he actually wants us to think about rivers coming out of us. And to put it rather bluntly, the only river I see coming out of me is not life, but death. I'm talking pee and poo, yeah? Perhaps you're offended at those words, or even more at the idea. You know, it seems to me we either ignore the topic of excrement or we make jokes about the topic in order to hide the topic like we're ashamed of the topic, and that's rather fascinating. Because what could be more natural, what could be more obvious to us than that? But we obviously don't want to see it. We deny it. So anyway, if I am honest, I don't have a river of life flowing out of me. I have a river of life flowing into me. It's called food. A river of life flowing into me uh, and, a, and a river of something else flowing out of me. With this old body of mine, with this, this flesh, I eat life, right? Plant life, animal life, body broken, blood shed, I eat. I eat, I eat life, it's called, called food. I eat life like a zombie or a vampire, like we've been preaching about for the last several weeks. I, I eat life and, and, I, and I poo death. <laughs> Isn't that weird? It's like my nature, my desire, my will is to take credit, take glory, take life from myself, which produces death, shame, and resentment like like a river, and, and I don't want to see it. I deny it. John seven thirty eight. Whoever believes in me, said Jesus, out of his heart, literally out of his belly, his guts, will flow living water. Like a river, the water of life. Life. What is life? Any honest biologist will tell you that we really don't know what life is. We cannot create it. However, we can describe it. It's like this uh, power, this will to will uh, what is not simply your will. It's individual entities, each willing a will greater than their own. A molecule in my body is alive 
because it wills to will the cell that, is, is, that it is a part of, right? A cell in my body is alive because it wills to will uh, the will of the organ or the body part that it is a, a part of. The finger in, in my body, my, my finger is alive because it like wills the will of my whole body. It wills the glory of my whole body. Perhaps I am only alive if I will the will of something greater than me. And God said, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. My finger dies when it's cut off from me or when it wills the will of something other than me. You see, then it becomes paralyzed, diseased, cancerous. That's what cancer is, a cell that wills its own will. Well, let me ask you this. When is my finger most free? When it's free of me? Or attached to me willing the glory of me <laughs> and see the glory of me turns out to be the glory of my finger that's life it's life well I ingest life and turn it into my own life and yet maybe I'm dead and no longer free for as we just established life is to choose the glory of another and I choose the glory of me so maybe I'm like a finger cut off from life and you know a finger cut off from life for a little while it looks alive and yet it's not really alive it's dead or, or maybe I'm worse than that not just dead but like the walking dead feeding on life and producing death a monster vampire zombie John 7 verse 17 what we preached on um, last week, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he'll know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. Y you see, I think um, a bad will is a will that seeks its own glory, and that's death. It's a will that's turned in upon itself like a black hole. A good will is a will that seeks the glory of someone greater than the self. It's a will that seeks a greater glory, and that's life. And, and you see, life, life is love, and God is love. God is love. You may say to yourself, well, hey, um, God seeks God's glory, doesn't he? So is he like a giant black hole? An enormous, selfish person? Well, you see, God is at least two persons, and we believe three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each of these persons seeks the glory of the other. Three persons constantly glorifying the other, serving the other like like a dance and you see that dance is love and love is life three persons one substance love a bad will seeks its own glory and a good will seeks God's glory and if you think about it that means that a good choice really doesn't have to do with what's chosen it has to do with the manner in which it is chosen in love or, or not in love. So you see, there are an infinite number of steps that can be chosen in a dance, and yet they all must be chosen in rhythm with the music, and the music is love. To dance, you, you don't control the music. The music must control you, capture you, romance you. So you don't choose love so much as surrender to love when love chooses you. And, and, and if you take credit for that choice, you're no longer dancing. As soon as you take credit for a good choice, it's no longer a good choice, but a bad choice. 
As soon as you take credit for goodwill, it's bad will. Bad will. For, for bad will is a will taking credit, right? Seeking its own glory. That's maybe why I myself can never simply choose the good once I'm bad. It's what Martin Luther described as the bondage of the will and why we cannot save ourselves. If, if I'm good, on the other hand, then choosing the good is simply being myself, unconscious of myself. And that's what we'd all like to be, but unfortunately, we've been bad. See, if I'm bad, I myself can't simply choose to be good. I, I can't simply choose to love, choose life. Why? Because well, the good is to seek another's glory, God's glory, and the bad is to seek my own glory. So if I'm already bad and someone says to me, hey, Peter, you should be good. You should be good. Well, I'll, I'll seek another's glory because that's good, right? I mean, I'll try to be good. I'll seek another's glory. Why? For my own glory, which isn't seeking their glory. It's pretending to seek their glory for my own glory, which really isn't glory, but death, dressed up like life. In other words, if I'm bad, and someone says to me, hey, Peter, you should be good. I'll invent religion. Become a Pharisee. I'll pretend to love, try to love, pretend to love for the sake of hate. I'll do evil and call it good. I'll eat life and crap death and become twice as much a child of hell. In the words of Jesus. Or maybe... Maybe I'll cry out, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? Save me. God save me. Yeshua, Jesus, save me. For, from what? From myself. From my will. And now this is a profound mystery, but it's not simply my old self that Christ saved me from myself. It's not myself, but another self being born within myself because myself can't save me from myself or it's just more self. My friend uh, Wayne, he's here somewhere. He sent me this video uh, a few weeks ago. It's a fellow recounting a near-death experience. Now, it's not scripture, so you can't take it on that, that same level, but, uh, but listen to what he claims to be saved from. And instantaneously, the thing that, that really struck me the most was there was a complete absence of the awareness of time. And I, was, I, was, I knew I was traveling. I could feel mm -hmm. you know, that I was traveling. And as I looked ahead, there was this pure white light. It was whiter than the whitest snow and brighter than 10,000 suns. And yet I could look right at it, and it was compelling. And it was like I was being towed, I was being towed like a tractor being, and as I was looking, I could feel this anticipation, wow. but then simultaneously to that, on my right side, I could feel something, and I looked, and there was this blackness sweeping, now this blackness, as I looked at it, instantly I was aware of its complete nature, you would not, I used to never be able to stand to be near anybody who could say go to hell after that, because you wouldn't want the worst person, no. you wouldn't want Adolf Hitler, Ben Laden, Saddam, you wouldn't want any human being to ever go in there. It was so horrible. And as that was sweeping, it got down to, it was eclipsing this light. So there was just this, it was like you're in a room and you close the door, a dark room, and there's a little space between the door and the door jam. It wasn't a doorway, it was really, this was a real place that I was seeing and that I was feeling. And as it was closing, it was eclipsing, and now I'm standing on the very edge, the precipice of eternal separation. And I scream out of my spirit, I'm sorry, I want to live. Give me another chance. And, and just before that was to close, I was standing in the presence of Almighty God. Wow. And instantly I knew that this being who off, was off on, on this side of me, uh, who I didn't see, but I was standing in this river of golden radiation. It looked like a moving river of golden light. And this river went that way, it went that way, it was underneath me, it was going right through me. And this river was alive. For years I wondered what was that blackness and why did it sweep down to where it was just a sliver, like about a half inch of white light. And years later, God revealed it to me. It was really a historical record of my life. That for all the years that I had lived, I was in darkness. And God gave me a space. Now, I don't know about everything he said. But did you notice how 
the light shone in the darkness. And did you hear what he said he was saved from? The darkness. And what was the darkness, he said? An historical record of my life. And what is life? I mean, isn't life, our life, what we call our life, made up of choices, billions of choices, chosen with our will. I think he was saying his will was void. It was the darkness, the outer darkness. Now, now think with me for a moment. When God wills something, what happens? It happens. Everything happens, right? Creation happens. When God speaks his word, creation springs into existence. And what is his word? We wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. His word is Jesus. Well, if God, if God's will is everything, then what is not God's will? Nothing, right? If God's will is everything, then what is not God's will is nothing. The outer darkness, the void. Regarding her famous vision, Julian of Norwich uh, wrote this. I saw that God does all that is done, and I was sure that God never sins. Therefore, it seemed to me that sin is nothing. And yet, that nothing is like a horrific something, the void. But think about it. What is death but the absence of life? What is a lie but the absence of truth? What is darkness but the absence of light? What is sin but the absence of love? And God is love, and God is light, and God is life. When we sin, we seek our own glory. We seek to create ourselves, and you see, all we create is an empty lie. We will ourselves into outer darkness, and we become outer darkness. Empty, void, in bondage to sin, and to death. That is how we create this body of sin and death. People sometimes say to me, oh, well, I have choice. I go, yeah, you do have a choice. You can choose to create your own particular body of sin and death. That's how we create this body of sin and death. We really must see that in ourselves we are nothing at all but sin and wretchedness, writes Julian. To Catherine of Siena, God is reported to have said this, I am he who is, you are she who is not. Anthony DeMello asks, have you experienced your is-notness? Soren Kierkegaard wrote, someone who is capable of nothing has every day and every moment the precious opportunity to experience that God lives. You see, maybe this sinful, old, self-absorbed me is like the empty place in which Christ is waiting to be born, the place where the light shines in the darkness and God is revealed. Maybe God cannot will sin, which means he cannot will nothing which means he will not will, not God. However, he wills for me to encounter, not God. That is evil. And that having known not God, I might one day love God in freedom. That having known evil, I might one day choose the good in freedom. 
And you see, that good choice in me is Christ born in me, faith, hope, and love in me, the word of God spoken into me, the, the void, such that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The only begotten, begotten in me, who is begotten from above. So maybe this old sinful me is like a step in creating the real me, the one in God's image the one who loves in freedom. Ephesians 1.11, he accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. I think that includes me. Ephesians 1.12, predestined to live for the praise of his glory, predestined to love God in freedom, to seek his glory. You see, I think we really are predestined for free will. Well, all this is it's really hard to talk about, isn't it? I mean, it's just confusing, and you want to just check out in the heat and go, I can't even do it. But, but, but I think part of why that's so hard, why this is so hard to talk about, is that right now there are like two wills occupying one space that's called me. Paul wrote this. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, the first Adam, we shall also bear the image of man of heaven, the last Adam, who has become a life giving spirit. It's like we are each uh, that fallen man of dust in bondage to a bad will. We're each a, a man of dust in bondage to a bad will. But when Christ sends his spirit, we begin to experience and begin to know a good will. But, but right now in this world, we're a mix of goodwill and bad will. And that stresses me out. If I get all stressed up about that, get all worked up all about that, what do I do? I just, I just mix it up. That's all I do. I just stir it up, mix it up. Me. Now, we are a mix. Bad will, good will, seeking our own glory, seeking God's glory. We have an old man that takes credit and we have a new man that gives credit to the glory of God. And if I try to sort them out, if I try to sift them out, judge them out, uh, how do I do it? I do it to my own credit. I only then become more dirty. You see, I can't cleanse myself with myself. It only gives me more of myself. I remember praying for my friends on countless times who, who was horrifically abused, and, and she'd have these visions, and in the visions, she'd start trying to clean herself, and Jesus would stop her, and he'd say, when you clean yourself, you only make yourself more dirty. I myself cannot sort myself out. And yet, until I am sorted out, I'm not free. My will is not free. It's an entangled will. I try to will myself out of that entanglement, and I only get more entangled. I mean, a good will is a humble will. It doesn't seek its own glory. And so I should be humble. I should be humble. I'm going to try to be humble. I'm going to be so dang humble. Ooh, I'm kind of getting humble. Crap, I'm not humble. Kierkegaard writes, freedom is the choice whose truth is that there can be no question of any choice. Emphasizing freedom of choice, focusing on my choice as such, means the sure loss of freedom. That's a wild statement, but I think we know it. If a musician deliberates about choosing each note, they're not really free, right? It's the musician it's the musician that doesn't deliberate about each note that plays in freedom. It's become his nature. It's the dancer that doesn't consciously choose each step that dances in freedom. So, you see, I can't will myself into freedom. I can't judge myself into freedom. I can't deliver myself into freedom. I can't should myself into freedom. I have to, like, surrender myself into freedom. You know, if I just let that vessel of dirt and water sit. If I just let my heart sit before Jesus, maybe the dirt, the dust, will start to separate from the water. Maybe I'll see my bad will separate from God's good will, God's will. 
kind of like that when I'm still. And then I see my bad will in light of God's good will. I see my bad will in light of God's good will when I stop. Shabbat, Sabbath, do nothing before him. Well, if, if I just see it, perhaps I'll stop hiding it. Perhaps I'll confess it because I can't seem to fix it. And perhaps that's the living water already beginning to bubble up in my soul. And if it turns into a river, it will wash me, wash me from the inside out and connect me to the kingdom of heaven, which is all around me, connect me to eternal life like a body part is connected to a body with what? A river of life. It's called blood. Through Jeremiah, God says, my people have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have made themselves cisterns. You know what a cistern is? It's a damned river. You know what a dead heart is? Maybe it's the same thing. Well, I can think of two wills in one space that is me, and I can think of two wills on one timeline that is me, or that I think is me. See, check out this picture. Uh, we think that a person is like the sum total of their decisions in time. See the little red dots? That's a, that's a good choice. The blue dots are a, are, are a bad choice. This is what we think. And so uh, through time, I make my different choices. You add them all up, and that's uh, the finished me at the end of the timeline. We think a person is a sum total of their choices, and you see, we still have a whole bunch of choices to make, right? And so that kind of stresses us out. In order to make ourselves into the person that we're going to be, we still have a whole bunch of choices. Well, Scripture says that Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And John says that we will be like him, and check this out, he is finished already. You know what the Apostle Paul says? He says that we are already seated in the heavenly places with Christ. Already. Like we are finished already. John, John saw the new Jerusalem coming down and he realized that it was him. He was right there in the wall. He saw the new Jerusalem coming down. He was part of that new Jerusalem, finished already. When Jesus meets folks, it's like he sees them not as they are, but as they will be or perhaps forever are, finished already already when he saw Peter he called him the rock like he is eternally the rock and only a coward for a moment in time but when he saw Magdalene he saw her as a bride as she is eternally the bride and maybe only a whore for a moment in time and yet that reveals that she is a bride forever by grace, forever by God's choice. And seeing it, God's choice becomes her choice. Well, anyway, we think we will forever be the product of our, show that other one again, Ben. We think we will forever be the product of our choices in time. But what if our choices in time are the product of the person that we already and eternally are. See that? What if, what if God like willed us first and created all space and time second? Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He predestined us according to his, the purpose of his will. Well, if God willed us first and created time second, then you cannot create yourself with your choices. You can only create a lie about yourself, a false self, a sinful self, an empty self.
If God willed us first and created time second, you don't create yourself with your choices in time. God has like already created you and is giving you your choices in time. Then every good choice, you see every red dot on that timeline is an agreement with eternity. And every bad choice is a rejection of eternity, of reality, of heaven, the rejection of eternal life, even your eternal life. And yet even, 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 even if you will yourself out of your own good story, your will is not stronger than God's will. And it is His will to will you back in and to reveal the very wonders of His grace. You see, our story is a love story. And at this cross, you are being romanced. And so God even descends into our nothingness to reveal His grace. So even our bad choices reveal His good choice that is Jesus. On the cross, He cried, It is finished. And even your bad choices are consumed by his good choices and turned into his will. Now I know all that's confusing. All of that was confusing. And, and, and maybe, maybe I said it not quite right. But this is my point. If I think that I must create myself with my choices. I will try to create myself in fear with works of flesh according to the law. I will begin to seek my own glory. I'll sin, consume life, excrete death. But if I believe that God has already created me, and it is finished, that he has chosen me and predestined me in love, and it is finished, then maybe that thirst to glorify myself would be satiated, and, and seeing the glory that glorifies me, I might choose to glorify him in freedom. I'd have no need to glorify me, but might want to glorify him. And you see, that is the river. If I see my bad will, I can see his goodwill, and that makes goodwill flow in me. At the cross, Jesus cried, it is finished. I, I think he means everything is finished because he tells us this is the judgment of this world. It is the right judgment which is grace. I am to judge all things with that judgment, his grace, I am to see myself and all things judged by grace and finished by grace. Now, let's finish uh, chapter 7 uh, real quick. 724, listen to him. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and there they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is, is the Christ? Then Jesus reveals they may know about him, but they don't really know him. They judge Jesus by appearances in bondage to their own will. Now all of this happens at the feast. Remember the Feast of Booze. And remember the Feast of Booze uh, commemorated Israel's journey from bondage to freedom. It commemorated uh, that journey and the harvest. Faithful love in freedom is the harvest of our journey these seven days. Well, at the feast, for seven days, Israel celebrated this elaborate water pouring ceremony in the temple. Uh, the water pouring ceremony uh, commemorated um, especially two things. The water, you remember the water of life that flowed out of the rock that followed the Israelites in the wilderness. And also uh, the river of life that flowed from the heavenly temple in Ezekiel's 
uh, vision. The, the priests would uh, march this water around the altar while the choir sung, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. On the last day, they marched around seven times and all the worshipers began to cheer and wave their palm fronds. Verse 37, on the last day of the feast, the seventh day or the Sabbath day, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, out of his belly, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Wow. As the scripture has said. But now this is kind of a weird thing. Because the scripture hadn't really said it. Not that, not like that. It said out of the rock, which turns out to be Christ, flowed a river of living water. And it said out of the true temple flows a river of living water. I mean, Jesus seems to think that we are like that temple. And he seems to think that he will like be inside of us and out of him will flow this river that will flow out of us. Verse 39, now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been uh, flowing or given, that's supplied by the translator, had not been flowing, given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. In John's gospel, Jesus is glorified on the cross. He is enthroned at the cross. And on the cross, he delivers up his spirit, a river of life, his good will, in the, in the Revelation, John's Revelation, he sees the new Jerusalem that is himself, and in it the throne of God. And, and listen to this. Maybe you've read this and go, what the heck? And from it, from it, the river of life. And on each side of the river and in its midst, the tree, the wood of life, the skulon of of life that can also be translated the cross of life one tree I mean it's like the river is flowing down the tree a river of life blood is a river of life right the life is in the blood the fountain was opened on Christ's tree and it is predestined to flow from our hearts that that river is the grace of God the free will of God, the good will of God, love. So pop quiz, okay, pop quiz. What flowed into Jesus on that tree? Our choice, right? Our will our sin, our darkness, our death, our waste, our hell. And what flowed out of Jesus from that tree? God's choice, God's will, grace, his life, his creation, his kingdom, love and love changes us. For the rest of chapter 7, people judge Jesus, seeking their own glory, unable to see Jesus. At the start of chapter 8, they throw a woman at Jesus' feet. She's been caught in the act of adultery. Adultery is bad will. It is consuming life and excreting death. Laying still before him to be judged by him. They throw him, they throw her at his feet in order that he would judge her. Well, laying still before him, she didn't speak, she didn't run, she stopped. Shabbat, Sabbath. Laying there, her heart must have been sifted, revealed like mud in this pitcher. It was revealed, but Jesus didn't condemn her. Actually, he condemns condemnation. You remember the story. He condemns 
condemnation and he says neither do I condemn you and that is his judgment it's like he didn't even see the dirt perhaps he wanted her to see the dirt to see the dirt so she could confess the dirt but he didn't see the dirt or, or better yet seeing the dirt seeing it he didn't reckon it he didn't count it as anything but a shadow destroyed by his light or a lie destroyed by his truth or death destroyed by his life I mean he saw her as a product of his choice not a product of her choice a whore he saw her as the product of his choice his bride his new creation he didn't see her as the product of her choices in time and that change that change her choices in time he said to her now go and sin no more see I would imagine that everywhere she went she sought God's glory because she wanted to Jesus eats death and excretes life. He eats bad will and oozes goodwill. It's called forgiveness. And forgiven much, we love much. We forgive much. In other words, we eat bad will and excrete goodwill. Grace. For on the night that Jesus was betrayed, given up, he took bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body given to you. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it, all of you. And Scripture told them over and over again, tells us, The life is in the blood. And so do you see what's happening? You're the woman. Caught in the act of adultery with a bad will, will. Have, having been thrown at the feet of Jesus in the presence of his glory. Let him expose your bad will so he can reveal his good will. And then God's will will become your will, the river of life. It's bubbling up and it turns into a river and scripture says one day that river will fill all the earth with glory but it starts right here right now as we worship and so come to the table tear off a piece of the bread dark cups are wine light cups are juice they're both life worship in Jesus name Amen. River of life. And this he said of his spirit. Now, I've seen the spirit of God do the most amazing things. I mean, it grew one of my legs out once. That's so freaky weird. I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, I've seen the Holy Spirit heal people empower people with gifts and wonders and yet according to the Gospels all those things are just signs they are not the substance they are not the power they are signs of the power they are not the substance of, of the power and it's Father's Day so, so I kinda wanna tell it to you this way okay my wife says I sh kinda shouldn't say this so if it bothers you, filter it out, all right? But I think it's this. He gives us the power to do this. In my flesh, what do I do? I eat life and I excrete something. There's a name for that, something that I think is very appropriate. It's a name I think Scripture uses a lot that gets translated out. God gives me the power. Jesus gives me the power to eat and excrete life. That's called forgiveness. The power of forgiveness. In heaven, everyone bleeds his blood into each other and it's a great dance, but in this world, we're at war. 
And the weapon of our war is forgiveness. And so may you believe the gospel and forgive. In Jesus' name and under the authority of his blood, amen.